one of the special guests. His name in the Hebrew pronunciation is Gidon uh, Koren. Anybody can repeat my Gidon Koren. Gidon Koren. Anyway, Gidon Koren received his uh, MD from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and then uh, spent some time at uh, Brigham in Boston. And now he's the head of cardiovascular research uh, center at uh, Brown University. Gidon has done a lot of work on transgenic animals, mice, and rabbits, which is really a gift to have a transgenic rabbit because of the similarity for us, because of the similarity of the action potential to that of the human and large mammals, having a plateau longer in duration than the mouse, and so closer to what humans are. I know that Dr. Nirborn has a comment to make, but <laughs> so can make it later. And, um, anyway, so Gideon, without uh, further ado, <laughs> he promised that he'll get a rabbit out of a hat. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, yeah. and thank you very much, Jerome, for the invitation and the <coughs> kind introduction to the beautiful city of St. Louis. So many years ago, I, uh, there was a uh, TWA existed, and TWA flew from Boston, where we lived for many years, to directly to Israel. So anywhere I went in the United States was with TWA. So everywhere I went in the United States was through St. Louis. So I visited St. Louis many, many times. But never got a real tour of the city. So thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. It's a beautiful city, great university. So, <clears throat> so what I'm here to talk about is, um, is um, transgenic rabbits with long QT model. And, um, <coughs> Essentially, now uh, we are um, studying rabbits from the neonatal level until the age. And, uh, and so we have projects for neonatal rabbit myocytes. We have projects for monkey tree rabbits, young and old rabbits, heart failure, myocardial infarction, and the aging rabbits. <coughs> and today, I will concentrate on uh, rabbit models for long QT syndrome. The mechanism of arrhythmia and long QT1 and long QT2 rabbits, sex hormones, gender, and cardiac arrhythmia, and long QT2 in the dish. <coughs> so 11 years ago, I was just a kid with a crazy dream. And I thought that we have to make a change. Work with gene and mice, we created a mouse with long QT2, especially the first mouse, and I felt that the mouse did so perfectly well. I felt that we somehow need a model that will emulate the human syndrome. So I also have three kids. I had three kids at the time. I have three kids. They're not kids anymore. And my son, <coughs> who was eight years old, always wanted a pet. <laughs> and never got a pet. There was no way he could convince my wife to have a pet at home. So every summer the kids flew to Israel, and we went to Israel, and he, we, went, we visited a friend of mine, and he had three dogs, five cats, and three rabbits. And my son sat with this rabbit the whole summer long. Come back home, and he has an English assignment to write a poem, and we write the poem, the pet I never had. The <laughs> 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 pet I never had. So he got a rabbit. <laughs> that lived with us in the basement. So I was playing with my son and the rabbit for many years. And that was when I think, oh, I can quit mice. <coughs> the first thing I thought was rabbit, and I checked the literature, I said, aha, I saw the light. Hence the rabbit. So long QT syndrome, we have 13 syndromes. And uh, we thought at the time that if we are going to challenge this field, we have to challenge, um, <coughs> at the time, what we knew is 90% of the genotype, which is long QT1 and long QT2. And, and that's a loss of function of IKS and IKR, which are the major repolarizing um, 
currents of the action potential. And that's what we targeted. We, and we decided to target two so that one will be the control of the other and we'll see what we can learn. <coughs> and the idea is that we really need an animal model to understand things that are happening with the human and we don't know why. So we know that the arrhythmia triggers in long QT tools, in long QT patients, are various are associated with sympathetic activation, but in different patterns. Long QT2 is a starter reaction. This is the famous arrhythmia of sudden death when the alarm clock reads. Or I had a patient that sort of ran, was hitchhiking in the Dead Sea, and the car stopped, and she started to run to the car and fainted. Donkey T1 is a more sustained <coughs> sympathetic tone. People who swim die in Donkey T1. So there is this spot <coughs> that causes Donkey T1, and there is emotion that are associated with Donkey T2, and this starter reaction. What is typical for Donkey T2 is that starting arrhythmia is the long, short, long, or the short, long, short here. That is Clinically, the typical starting uh, arrhythmia of that, uh, the arrhythmia that triggers the polymorphity, while long QT1 is R on T. Straight R on T, and you start the arrhythmia. So why, why, why do we have a difference? What's the basis for the difference? So the post-related short, long, short is LQT2, R on T is LQT1. So there are different sympathetic triggers that cause the arrhythmia. What else we know is that there are general differences in cardiac improvisation are steep, steeper QTRR in women than men, and there is age-related gender differences in cardiac event. So in childhood, in long QT overall, and more in long QT2, there are more deaths in boys than in girls. And everybody thought, well, it's boys who are very active, sports, etc. That's what they are done. While in post-puberty, male sort of plateau, <coughs> and female has a rising incidence of arrhythmias. So, what's the basis for it? Hence, the creation of of models that will try to resolve. So, choosing a rabbit again heart rate which is closer to human, the rate is in 200, not in the 600, action potential has a plateau, main contractor protein is beta myosin in heavy chain, EC coupling is similar to human, the aging heart behave like the aging human heart we know now. So there are many similarities between rabbit and the arrhythmia, the VF, the frequency is similar to the human arrhythmias. So the approach we chose is actually built on our experiment with Jim at the time. We found out that in mice, whole mutants behave like knockout. We said, okay, that's a legitimate way of doing business in rabbits. And we'll create a trust gene that will be driven by the rabbit beta a heavy chain promoter, will have a flag tag, and will have a poor mutant, because we knew from the mice experiment that poor mutant are the most dominant negative effect because you need four subunits and one subunit. If you overexpress it and it's a dominant negative subunit with a poor mutant, it's ideal to knock down functioning, knock down the gene. So the mice taught us a lesson, a very important lesson. And we took the human cDNA, despite not having the rabbit cDNA, and we, based on small sequence that was published at the time, there was a complete homology at that sequence. And we reasoned that we can overexpress the human mutants in the rabbit and we'll, be, we'll do just fine. There was a risk involved. And indeed, we, we did just fine. And that's just tell you, just from visually, how similar rabbits are to human. So if this is the PQ, QRS, T wave of a little bit controlled, that's how long QT2 looks. And this double hump is actually seen in human with long QT2 syndrome. And that is the long QT1 rabbit. These are the two founders, 22 and 33, 002. 
and, set, and 033. And these are the founders. And you see that the, that was the first surprise that sort of the QT prolongation is parallel <coughs> to the QTRR <coughs> of the lithomates or, or negative of the transgene. Yes? Corey, um, you said there it's 100% homology uh, amino acid. Uh, one. 98. Okay. And that's, and now that, we know. that was. Now we know. Substituted. Okay, oh, I see what you mean. So the pro mutant is a pro mutant. It's a mm. human pro mutant. One came from Salt Lake City, one from France. Mm. But we overexpressed the human pro mutant in the rabbit, and the proteins are almost identical. That's why we have the reaction, the response. So it's true that the ECG picker here is twice as fast as a human. So first we sat down and we took a look at what's happening with these rabbits and what is, was very interesting and was very disappointing initially. And now we know it's sort of a mind goal for us. Is that the NQT1 did not die. And, but NQT2, as of sexual puberty, about uh, five months of age, started to die with almost 50% mortality at we have here 60% mortality at, uh, over a year. And so. Can we have QT1 don't die? Do they have arrhythmia? No. And I'll get back to it because now we know how to make them die in three weeks 100%. <laughs> you just showed us they have prolonged PT. They have prolonged PT. They have prolonged PT. Prolong prolong so it's a different mechanism of arrhythmia. So, but the males and females die because the herd mutant both men, that's a good point. Both female and male die at the same rate. So not completely, but as I'll, I'll show you later, the first male rabbit, we didn't make the founder. And we made the founder, but then we used F founders are F0, we used F1 to make them. The first F1 male rabbit that we breed. After the first round of breeding, he was gone. He said, aha, uh -huh, that's not good. Too much excitement in his life. We'll breed female. So we bred female on QT2 with normal white type male. Pregnancy was fine. Rabbits, three liters were born. All three rabbits post-pregnancy died suddenly. And we long, <coughs> no longer made female. That's a classical long QT protected during pregnancy, postpartum, they have a That generated the project of hormones, sex hormones, and arrhythmias. So, <coughs> all rabbits are monitored. And so we implant transmitters at the back of the rabbits, and it doesn't matter whether it's a five months old, 12 months old, four years old, six years old, all rabbits that entered the study, and now we reach number 3,500, are monitored. So we have six terabytes of monitoring data. So that we will open for anyone who's interested. You're more than welcome. There is a rabbit that die, rabbit that don't die, young rabbit, old rabbits. Everybody is welcome to this database. And that's the monitoring <coughs> data. That's the clean. Sometimes they're not as clean as hmm. this. And you see here long QT and rhythm and control. So the first, in the first publication, we published this QTRR. And what you see here is the phenomena that in um, free moving rabbits, and that was a surprise when you do the average QT prolongation compared to rhythm and control, it's prolonged as much in long QT1 as in long QT2, despite the fact in our recent J physiology paper, there is three times more IKR than IKS. Now, if you look at the QTRR slopes, these are the little bit control. Blue is always LQT1, red is LQT2. You see that we have this, LQ, the slope is slip, steeper in LQT2 compared to LQT1. And there is this red line that we published initially, and we didn't understand why is there such an overlap with the rhythmic control. These are the partial phenotypes. Later on, we found 
that these rabbits do not maintain the phenotype. That's the problem with transgenic rabbits. You constantly have every generation to screen them and we develop the QT index and we screen them. And the partial phenotypes are low expressor of the transgene. We correlated the QT interval and the QT index with the level of the transgene. So the rabbits have a way to shut down the transgene. And once our vet, collaborating vet in Penn State, complained about using Winbrook rabbit, and he said that Robinson rabbits are much kinder to females. And why don't we use Robinson rabbits? So we brought in 15 breeders from Robinson rabbit. We bred them with the long QT2. All males were negative in terms of phenotype. They shut down the transgene. So all rabbits from different places are not born the same. And they, they can shut down transgenes. So it's a constant search and find mission to maintain the phenotype. <clears throat> so about the long QT being the same, this is in, in free running rabbits. Right. So, so you see the QTRR, you okay. see the difference. It's slow yeah, rate. There is some, but there is some uh, beta adrenergic tone right. in this rabbit. Yeah. So, so the 3 to 1 ratio is probably when you have zero tone. But this is in single cells. Right. So that there is no right. iso. Right. So it's less than 3 to 1 once right. you have this. So functionally, LKS play a more important role in the free moving rabbit than what we find in single cell when we patch plant them without eye. Yeah. So that's, a, that's a, and we saw it immediately with the family. So what, how do they die? This is a rabbit that we did the ECG in, in Penn State with the, by Gemini and that rabbit 69 that we erected the statue that is the first rabbit that we actually found with the polymorphic BT and the short long short initiating the arrhythmia. So all long QT rabbits die suddenly with polymorphic VT, short long short, no exception. This is a rabbit in the operating room who woke up in the middle of anesthesia. Not good for FQT2 rabbits because you see what happened? But this was sort of terminated spontaneously when anesthesia was restored. So blood pressure drops to zero immediately. What do you know, mean? oftentimes when low QT patients die, or have syncope, they don't have palpitation, no symptom. Blood pressure drops dramatically down right away. And that's sort of the, ex the experiment that proves why. What is the mechanism of arrhythmia? So Boomerang Choi lab, with water-sensitive dye and calcium-sensitive dye, looking at arrhythmia and the rabbit and that's published. This is the system that he used, that he shared with other people, the software uh, with the two CMOS cameras and the light source, and this, the, the rabbit heart hangs on, over there. And what he showed that, that we published is that essentially, if you look at APD dispersion and APD map, Long QT1 and long QT2, both the APD is prolonged, but there is a big difference between um, APD dispersion. There is a dispersion in repolarization, as you see here, in long QT2, but no dispersion in intermate control in long QT1. So again, mechanism of arrhythmia is different, as it presents itself, it's different. We think that probably IKS that is, exists here, doesn't exist here, play a major role in this, but it's very difficult to prove it because it's very difficult to optically map and we tried it and isolate the cell and prove the point. Because at the time you hang the heart, you optically map, you, and then you want to isolate tissue, you move the system, we have a... So, so this, this, um, this is from the epicardial surface? Right. And have you, have you tried to give ISO to this heart? And yeah. see if you have increased this person? Yeah. So when you do program simulation, you can induce BF in all, or most QT2 rabbit, and we've done, we've done many more than since the publication. What happens is that you have a reentrant arrhythmia BF around the island with a long APD, as it shows here. But you cannot induce by program stimulation arrhythmia in long QT1 and intermate control. So, what Boomerang have shown, and that's unpublished data, is that short, long, short increased dispersion. 
And so that set up, and what really kills this rabbit, and I'll show later, are triggered activity EAD. So this rabbit, when we do with the patch clamping, IK, um, long QT1 don't have IKS, and long QT2 do not have IKR, and the APB is prolonged. And that is an interesting phenomenon that we discovered, and then followed up with another paper and now a more recent study, is that in long QT1, no IKS, but IKR is reduced. So there is no comp compensatory response in the world. Uh, sorry, in low QT2, no IKR and IKS is reduced. In low QT1, IKS is gone and IKR is reduced. So the poor mutant inhibits the reciprocal curve. Now, there was a paper, but uh, the first one to discuss this interaction was Eric and Stan Mattel. Nobody believed this data that they showed that perhaps there is an enhancing activity when they co express uh, Q1 and H1. <coughs> And H2. Uh, but um, we find when we, uh, in the follow up paper that Fran published in AJP two years ago, we found that when you co express pole mutants with a one type channel, it suppressed the current. And, and the channel interaction, we have biochemical data, and we have uh, surface plasma resonance data that the two C termina interact with each other. And that's the, the mechanism of interaction, or at least the site of interaction between the two rabbits. And <coughs> Louise Dowling uh, had a poster last by a physical society, those who stopped by that poster that show FRET data between fluorophore XFPs and the C terminal uh, Q1 and H1 when they co express. They have FRET, so they are FRET positive. And that threat is suppressed by cyclic MP, interestingly enough. So that leads to already three projects about Q1 and H1 and H2 interacting. So the concept of repolarization reserve is more complex than we think that there might be cross talk between the two channels. And we know that in Revit there is sort of a, a different gradient between Q1 and, and H2 and apex to base. They are sort of mirror image of each other. Now, what happened, can you induce spontaneous EADs? And that's a paper that is just came out in J Physiology. You don't see Liu is the patch clamper. When he reduced uh, K out to 3.6, obviously what happens is APP goes up, resting potential goes to the negative side, but only in long QT2, myocyte, you can induce this EAD with a take of potential about minus 25 millivolt. <coughs> So in most statistics, you can see here that zero in the same 3.6 in literate control and 13 out of 16 in long QT2. So you can, with low range of potassium, even the hypokalemia effect on IK1 and others, you can induce spontaneous EAD and in one cell you can see it's failure to repolarize or to subdeploy the single cell level. So any myocytes can do it. So what's the story behind the sympathetic surge in long QT2? And that's sort of the key finding of the paper. So ISO, so ISO enhances both IKS and ICA. And that's essentially 80 or 90 percent, I was taught today, of regulating APD. Mainly IKS wins. ICA allows eventually, but the kinetics are different. And this is key regarding EAD. The tau for IKS is 43.6 seconds. The tau for RCA is 9.2 seconds. So in the sympathetic surge you have there, ICA is on much sooner and much faster. If you think about window current and EAD, we think that is the sympathetic surge. Now, is it true? So we went to optical mapping. And optical mapping, we have little mate control, you have long QT1, you have long QT2, this is the window of opportunity, and we'll go back to long QT1. If you inject ISO, about 150 nanomolars, a micromolar, don't remember. If 
150 nanomoles, by 150 nanomoles. You can see this effect of EAD, but then it disappears. So you have this immediate response that you can see this EAD, but then the action potential shortens. IKS turns on, action potential shortens, and you know where you have a window of a very narrow window of opportunity to have this EAD when you have the sympathetic surge. And the short long show increase the dispersion and set up <coughs> the substrate for the arrhythmia. So you need the EAD, and we have rhythms of short long short. Short long short don't induce arrhythmia. And then the sh the shot just moved by a couple of milliseconds, boom, you have the two other point and the rabbit dies. APD in long QT2 shortens with ISO. Long QT1 long, uh, gets longer, and this is a technical test known, and we'll come back to it. So, in summary, in long QT2, we have sympathetic surge likely induction of ICA faster than IKS, that is the window of opportunity to have an EAD, and that on the basis of dispersion of repolarization, you have re-entry and you have a re -entry. Long QT1 is a different story. So that's, oftentimes people ask me, how long do rabbit die? This is the founder, the rabbit founder. And we kept three Long QT1 rabbits for a long, long time. And what you see here, he dies at the age of seven years and two months, from age-related phenomena, urine, GI tract not working well, the rabbit sort of deteriorating in the vet tells me, look, <laughs> enough is enough. You can't keep this rabbit long. And that is how we sacrifice long QT2. And you see fibrosis. And indeed, in aging rabbits, whether they're long QT1, so long QT1 rabbits don't <coughs> die, even if you age them, and we kept a couple for five years, six years, and seven or two years. Spontaneously, they don't die. You see this fibrosis? This fibrosis is classical fibrosis for aging rabbits. So we have a colony of rabbits four years and above, up to six and a half years. And we studied, and this is published, this is in press in AJP. And, and uh, they have increased fibrosis. This is around papillary muscle is, uh, is a classical site. Now, we reasoned that we have to do something about the heart rate of long QT1 to bring it to perfect human-like heart rate. Maybe this is the issue. So you need fast heart rate, but perhaps the rabbit's faster heart rate is protective. So the way we thought to, uh, to do it, and then essentially the way we did it is uh, in vivo by accessing the right femoral vein and doing RF ablation of the AV node. And uh, you insert a pacemaker to the apex of the RV to keep the rabbit alive with 90 beats per minute. And, and all the rabbits have a transmitter. So there is a lot of hardware that goes into the rabbit. You first start with a transmitter and a lead and a pacemaker. You wait until the rabbit survived the surgery. Some don't. A lot don't, unfortunately. And then you bring it to the EP lab to do radio frequency ablation. I cannot do it, but they are talented. Ohad Zid, now at Case Western, the Royal uh, Case Western University, uh, is the one that initiated this uh, program. And so this is a little bit controlled with AV ablation. So we have four groups. We have long QT1 with ablation, later one control with ablation, and then we do sham. All these in vivo experiments, you need to have shot. And that's the survival curve. This is long QT1. This is little bit control the die with AV block, and these are the shot. So all long QT1 rabbits, and the plan was to study them after 21 days. All long QT1 rabbits died within less than three weeks. And what do they die from? The classical RNT, not short, long, short. Like humans, like ut one RNT, and polymorphic VT. All of them. Just one more picture, and glitamate control die with short, long, short, because they die, there is done with, with time, and that's a paper by Stan Lattel, when they do ablation, there is done regulation of IKR and IKS, 
and your time is short, long short, but 20 to 30 percent after three weeks. Yes. Just on the previous two slides, uh, no, the previous one, there's a significant ST segment elevation. Well, this is a pacemaker. This is AV block, so the ventricle right. is so, spaced, so there is repolarization of normality. Well, you expect to have a wide QRS, but uh, there's... Well, I don't know. Yeah, well, I don't and, know. And this then is, the, this is telemonitoring. Okay. And, and two more uh, slides, there's... Uh, so, see. this is telemonitoring data. And mm -hmm. I don't know exactly here. So, it's one lead. Very difficult to determine where the QRS ends. Mm -hmm. And the QRS is very narrow in rabbits. I think... Probably it narrows right. somewhere here, and it's wider than what you think it is from the first one. Mm -hmm. And there is, uh, but the, and there's uh, ST segment deviation. Uh, uh, this one, uh, there's another. That's another one that would kind of scare most clinicians. And, and then again here, um, uh, the I, I saw the there was an RF catheter that was burning the AV node. Yes. Um, is it? It doesn't because stay. That looks like um, ST segment elevation that it was somebody would have an acute MI4 that would potentially cause that. I'm just wondering how how, uh, I, how you know that you so this could be fluid. This is the P wave. It could be P wave which follows QRS So this is a P wave you see here. And it all overlaps the steep onset after J point retrograde. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is, this is the usual uh, ECG we see with the pacemaker that is implanted in the apex of the right ventricle. We have this ST abnormality. So we are very sensitive to ST abnormality. Mm -hmm. And in when we do procedure in rabbits, and we do procedures like 2MI by implanting cores in the coronary artery. Yes, yes, yes. So we know when to be worried about ST elevation and when not to be worried. <coughs> this is part of having a pacemaker in the right ventricle. This is how we do. I so we are not worried. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not familiar with rabbits, but that All right. would scare and, and me if it was in a human. And, and so. I understand the point. The point is that they, <laughs> that's not the issue. And and the litmus control rabbits again, most of them live in the three weeks and go. Do, do, do they have a similar um, ECG? That is a litmus control rabbit. Okay. Yeah. That's why I took litmus control. Mm -hmm. So. So there are 150 nanomolars so to solve the issue. This is the rabbit with longitude one, and this is acute ablation of the AV node. So in, in ex vivo, when Boomerang takes the rabbit and injects 150 nanomolars of isopaternal, he gets this polymorphic VT with an R on T. And he gets it in longitude one, but he doesn't get it in intermediate control. So this is sort of perfusing them with the isoprotanol, and that induced this arrhythmia. And when Bulmark uh, takes a camera and look at the endocardium and the epicardium, and I didn't bring the movie, the, the arrhythmia is caused by shifting foci. And the foci, similar to the ECGI that you just look at the epicardium, here he looks at the septum, the endocardium, and the epicardium with two cameras, and you can see with the epi, that he can map origins, and there was a, a brown undergraduate student that looked at the screen and map where is the sort of the most concentric and where is the, what we can define as origin the first, and there are, um, you can see here a different concentration um, of uh, isopaternal, the origin of the, I, uh, the EADs is everywhere, and it's, we think that if the sh shifting foci is increased automaticity that one foci triggers the other, and that's how the arrhythmia spreads around. And if you isolate single cell of long QT1, any myocyte, and you give them 50 nanomolar of isopaternal, in seven out of 19 myocytes, you can induce this series of EADs. And you can have cells that will behave with failure to repolarize. So any myocyte in long QT1 with ISO, can induce this arrhythmia. What we are busy looking right now is underneath the membrane what is going on with calcium in this cell. And again, with optical mapping, what you saw before, 
is the phenomenon that <coughs> it's the continuous exposure to ISO that then leads to this phenomenon. So this is the tonic phase of, of, uh, of um, stimulation by the sympathetic system. So essentially our rabbit solved uh, 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 this idea or this question of what's the difference between the sympathetic surge in long PT2 and the sympathetic tone in long PT1. So do you know what the trigger is in vivo, in you know the bladed rabbits? So you give ISO. Oh, so you gave ISO. You give ISO. Those yes, also. and the bleed without ISO oh, okay. And it's coming late. So no ISO, no arrhythmia. And with ISO, you start to see calcium waves. Now, what's the what's the relationship between the calcium wave and the membrane potential oscillation? That's needs to be further studied. <clears throat> so sex hormone and cardiac arrhythmias. So the phenomena is indeed that long QT2 patients die postpartum. And I apologize, this is a bit. So there is low risk of cardiac events during pregnancy and full time increased risk of to start the poor postpartum, where progesterone is downregulated, and this is particularly true in located. So this is well known in the in the in the in the literature. And that, with the phenomena that we see in our rabbit postpartum rabbit, um, really served as the basis for the, the the idea that all rabbits died. The idea of um, um, despite the no gender difference in sudden cardiac death in one particular rabbit, that started the idea of um, Somehow, sex hormones and the phenomena of sex hormones and sudden cardiac can be tested in these rabbits. So that was the hypothesis: sex hormones alter their arrhythmogenic risk in long QT2 in vivo by modulating substrate and trigger vulnerability. <coughs> Six groups were studied: sham female, ovariectomy is rapid, estrogen treatment, progesterone, DHT, and sham male. Katia Denning start, uh, started this project. She now has her own lab in um, Taipo, studying other hormones and sudden cardiac death. And the all, all the rabbits went pre-pubital ovariectomy at 90 days. So many studies in rabbits are done in 90 days old rabbits. These are pre-pubital rabbits. So that's a, a, a common mistake in the literature that, people, that investigators are not waiting until rabbits are sexually mature. Now, rabbits are induced ovulator. So sex hormone regulation of its the effect has, is a complex issue. There are genomic effect, there are membrane receptors to sex hormone. There is probably um, effects on histones. So, Rabbit's level of uh, estrogen is about 20 nanogram per, uh, 27, 30 nanogram per deciliter. And then when you do a variectomy, it goes down. But they don't cycle they, unless they mate. They're very efficient breeders. If you mate them, they cycle, they ovulate, and you have a colony of rabbits. <coughs> so all of them, again, ECG transmitter and in vivo electrophysiological study. These are the home levels by standard pellets that may match physiological levels during pregnancy. <clears throat> and this is DHT. The idea with the DHT is an ongoing project that DHT will be protected in males. But we wanted to test the DHT in females too. Anyhow, we show that um, weight is affected by DHT, and now you know the whole story of uh, baseball players and hormones. But the, there is no hypertrophy. So if you look at the QTRR, the QTRR is being affected by, um, by these hormones. And estrogen therapy steepens the QTRR. DHT treatment has the reverse effect, progesterone no effect. And ovariectomy is sort of reducing estrogen has the negative effect of estrogen. This is interesting while well, we we'll look like later on at the ion channel currents. And we did some uh, catalytic program stimulation that shows that <coughs> uh, 
there are difference in the um, verb, the effective refractory period with estrogen <coughs> when you did isoprotonally shortens the effective refractory period and the maximal effect is with estrogen. So somehow estrogen primes the effect of isoprotonol in terms isoprotonol in terms of shortening the uh, um, the effective refractory period, despite the fact that they're, they're, to begin with they are longer. So this is sort of the main effect. The main effect is looking what happened in this. So to, the hormone pellet is good for 12 weeks. The entire study was 11 <coughs> weeks. The rabbits were program stimulated at around eight to nine weeks, and then we followed up. And what's happening is that rabbits were treated with estrogen at a remarkable number of major events, which is significant arrhythmia, which we see. Uh, which we define as non-sustained VT and sudden death. But if you look at sudden death here in brackets, estrogen rabbit died, while ovariectomy rabbits die, and they have other effects like uh, sustained arrhythmia, but progesterone rabbit was completely protected. The DHT rabbits, the hydrogen <coughs> was also protected. And the rabbits, with estrogen, all died with short, long, short. You can see here short and another short, long, and the short and the induction of arrhythmias. And when you look at the monitoring, and that's why you monitor everything to get this data, that is very interesting. Progesterone essentially shuts down arrhythmogenesis. So the rabbit that died and the rabbit that survived, there is much more arrhythmia, significant arrhythmia, in rabbit that died compared to rabbit that don't die. And in estrogen versus progesterone, you can see here how progesterone suppressed all arrhythmia. It's like it suppressed the trigger. When you look at, uh, when Burak looked at the optical mapping of this rabbit, what he showed with Katya is that there is no difference in the dispersion among the different treatments. In estrogen, there is sort of a movement of the long, here is the short, here is short, short, the sort of towards the base, we see the island with the long, in estrogen it's sort of reversed and it's in the apex. And this indu inducibility was slightly higher in estrogen. <coughs> And when you induce VT by program stimulation, the VF surrounded this area <coughs> of APD, as you can see in the next picture. So repetitive activation pattern, this paper is in, in, in press. It will come out this May in Hadwin. And uh, <coughs> the numbers are higher in the paper than is here in the slide. But you can see here the VF sort of surrounding this voltage and calcium surrounding this island of the APD <coughs> when you induce them. What happened with you do AV when you do inject this rabbit with estrogen? This is the most interesting finding of the paper, which correlates very well with um, the finding by monitoring. So this is calcium and this is voltage. And you induce calcium, you induce EADs and triggered the activity with isopaternal in ablated AV node located to two rabbits. Four out of four in estrogen. And you can see that there is perhaps rise in calcium before the rise in the change in voltage here, you can spread it again. But what is very interesting in progesterone is that in two thirds of the rabbits, we have this uncoupling of calcium oscillation from the Now, how do you understand this? What's going on? It fits very well the fact that all arrhythmia was suppressed in the rabbit. So we have no EADs, we have no BPPs, we have no couplets, we have no non-sustained VP. But what explains it is what we sort of be working on in the next future with the ZDQ as, um, as um, our computational biologies and Alain Karma too, the different levels. The cellular level, 
at the tissue level, at the organ level, because we don't know where uncoupling happens. This doesn't tell us that the uncoupling is at the cellular level. It might be at the tissue level. It might be at the organ level. System biology can help. What happened in terms of the currents, you can see here that progesterone suppresses ICA. That's an antiarrhythmic effect. Estrogen increases IKS. No change in IK1, no change in ITO. The other thing that progesterone does is upregulate CO2. Which some view as a prorhythmic and some view antiarrhythmic. If you have decreased delta calcium current and increased CO2, that could be an antiarrhythmic effect. But it doesn't explain the uncoupling because we still have calcium oscillation. So that's not the entire explanation. So we went ahead and we are doing proteomics and com uh, com uh, comparing hormone treatment by DIGE and our marked difference between progesterone upregulated and estrogen upregulated. Uh, and <coughs> some of them are key enzymes that sits and can affect multiple networks of protein. So DIGE and pro um, high throughput proteomics could be very helpful in dissecting out perhaps the uncoupling. And the, the most significant finding is when I called Arthur Moss and told him, look, this is the finding. Please look at your database, long QT registry. He said, well, I don't think so. I said, please. <laughs> so unethically said, I said, I don't <laughs> think so. Just do me a favor, take a look. And that is the results of Arthur Moss doing retrospective, unofficial, look at his registry of patients and they list on, progest on oral contraceptives and no oral contraceptives. Yeah. And the phenomena here are, are pretty straightforward. Now, it's not published because it's retrospective and it's not doing now looking patient by patient and we need a prospective study. And that's why my editorial say there's no way that you can base anything. And I don't think that any all progesterone, we are using progesterone. Not all progestin behave like progesterone. We know that pro different progestin will have different molecular effect on different tissues. Yes, please. Most oral contraceptives are combination estrogen, progestin, analogs. So, so how most, could you use that to actually so, make any valid comparison? So if I will design a, pro a prospective No, no, not prospective, but how can you use this to? So most oral contraceptives are primarily progestin with a very little 50 nanogram of estrogen mm -hmm. that is priming the progestin effect. It's but not their physiolog combination, all right? Yes, but the, the estrogen is negative though, in terms of yeah. the effect. It's it the main effect is progestin. Mm -hmm. But if I will do a protective, protective uh, project, if I do a study, prospective study, I won't use a combination. I will use progesterone only. And then <laughs> I have to select the, the third generation progestin. Yeah, no, I, respectfully, I, I would argue that then, if they didn't need it, they wouldn't put it in there, right? So that there's some effect of the estrogen and the, the the effect of the progesterone it primes. You need some the effect of the nuclear receptor of progesterone is primed by estrogen because it increases the synthesis of the nuclear receptor of progesterone. So in order to have the effect, that's why they had the combination. It's a well-known uh, phenomenon in the hormonal literature. And it's a low dose. It's one percent or less than a dose that if you give hormone replacement therapy, you give hundreds. Yeah, HRT. Yeah, that's a completely different. Yeah. 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 But that raised the issue of hormones. That raised the issue of hormones and aging. Hormone replacement therapy, and we are testing it right now in the aging population. Some get progesterone. Some get estrogen because these trials were stopped because of increased cardiovascular mortality, <coughs> but nobody looked at actually at something that there were not enough cases to, to power it to look at sudden cardiac death because sudden cardiac death is a relative rare phenomenon. So we are testing it in our old rabbit soil, and that's not easy because when you deal with 
postmenopausal rabbits, which are entire bitter, and you give them estrogen, they have become very aggressive. And my staff, I get phone calls all the time. So it's a hard study to conduct. But I think it's important to look at hormones and and because we don't know what the effects of estrogen on the ECG, what will be the effect of the progest progesterone, what does it do on calcium, the changes in calcium dynamics that are related to aging, it makes arrhythmia more vulnerable as we age, we had eightfold increase in sudden cardiac deaths in the 60s and the 70s, so to protect our own interest, we are studying the aging. And in those data, were they um, both types or all types of monkey no, these are these are wild type rabbits. The aging no, rabbit. No, no. This in the registry data from Martin Moss. So this is all types of monkeys. Types. But most of them are long pity one monkeys. Probably eighty percent. Eighty percent. Yes. And the effect is the strongest in long pity too. Yes. So long pity in the dish. So we are not in the IPS cells. We decided to, um, since we are studying rabbits, we'll isolate neonatal rabbit cells. And it took us hard work to get this system up and running because you isolate cells that are rod shaped and immediately they round up. And you can't use the regular techniques to separate fibroblasts and myocytes. Took a long time to set up the data, but eventually we get to the point in our turn of the light. First one. The other one. Oh. Here. Yeah. That's it. That's it. All right. So these are composite figure from Louise, darling, and what you can see here is a rabbit, regular culture. <coughs> you can see here the myocytes and the fibroblasts. It's about 80% myocytes. You can see here Western blots of cardiac specific proteins of your liking, including circa. They do express sodium channels, but they suppress sodium channels. These are Louise overexpressing CFP and YFP, KCMQ1 and KCH, and, uh, CFP, HERG, and KCMQ1, YFP in the myocytes. Is the HERG, is the KCMQ1. Here she proves that she's infected, she is expressing it, transfecting into myocyte by alpha actinin. These cells become all sort of bizarre shape in the culture. And she can show FRET by acceptor photobilage in hex cells and similar FRET in myocytes between C termini. So that's what we can use. We can use this system, and we are using the system to find what is the mechanism of uh, progesterone regulation of sigma. These neonatal rabbit cells allow us to molecularly define it, and it's not transcription. Optical mapping of neonatal rabbit cells done by Boomerang, slow stability and slow conduction. And this is our proud new things that we do. We can pattern these neonatal rabbit cells in the culture. These are 75 and this is microprinting, laminin here, 75 micron, 100 micron gap, another 75, and these are electrically stimulated. And what is interesting that with the electrical simulation, it rejects the fibroblast from the culture, from the strips, and here we have primary myosin. We stain for connecting 43 here. And it's like in the matter rabbit cells, it's perinuclear in between the membrane, which stands for circa, that are rich and rich in circa. We can induce alternance in long QT2 myocytes in culture. And I will ever with the summary that long QT2 rabbits develop spontaneous CDP and sudden cardiac death while slowing the heart rate triggers spontaneous arrhythmia in long QT1. We entered arrhythmias in long QT2 are caused by sympathetic surge, likely mediated through upregulation of LTCC current. Migrating fossae of trigger <coughs> activity in LKT1 are caused by high sympathetic tone. In long QT2 rabbit, estrogen predisposes to arrhythmia while progesterone is protective through uncoupling of calcium and oscillation from memory potential. 
are projecting a new class of Ontario with environments. So many thanks for the people who were helpful. I showed their pictures. This is Long Xin Liu, now in Gilead Science, the patch clamper, professor of J Physiology, Hitesh with the proteomics, Ulrich Amende, and Michelle with the, from CBSC on the, the printing in collaboration with Diane Hoffman Kim, Louise Darling with the neonatal rabbit cells, Katya with the estrogen, and the arrhythmias, she is in Friday now, OHAD in Metro Health with the ablation of the AV node. The team in the cath lab, rabbits are USDA protected, everything needs to be documented. IACU sits on me all the time, OR, etc. These are two brown undergraduate that did, Jackie did 20 constructs for the YFPCFP and Amanda did all the patch clubbing of the YFPCFP and Ken C. Run and Hearn. Katie Hartman is a medical student now. She did all the arrhythmia analysis of the estrogen and progesterone treated rabbits. Again, Louise Darling. Um, and I think Boomerang Choi, which I don't, you know, he just left before we took this picture. This is the, <laughs> so, sorry about that. So who else to, to um, um, thank is Diana of Monkin, Manfred and Michael Brunner, collaborators from, from Freiburg University, Arthur Moss and Alon Basheshet um, in the collaboration about the retrospective look at the longitude registry. The team in the animal, Zilin, Q, and Alain Kama, we collaborated with computational biology. Xuan Peng, the long time collaborator in Penn State, where we do the outsource the breeding. Ulrich Amende with the cell patterning from CBC Boomerang showing his lab in the opt on the optical mapping. Did I forget anyone? And white people, Gongsin and Wuyan Li. Patch lighting, Leroy Cooper does the aging rabbit, he touched with the proteomics, Jason runs the lab. Zizeng is looking at um, males with orchiectomy. Yi Chun Lu does all the primary neonatal rabbits. And Louise Darling with a nice figure you show uh, with the fret Katya with the hormones, Katie Harmon and Emily Lowe with analysis of the data. And special thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Question. Yes. <coughs> Disconnecting of the of the calcium waves from the electrical signal. You, you say you've got upregulation of circa, right. which could be s making the calcium come down by pumping into the SR rather than leaving via sodium calcium exchange. Mm, so you could be losing an inward sodium current. Otherwise, what about other calcium activated inward currents like? Calcium chloride currents, maybe some sort of so, Do you look for anything like that? Not yet. So this is sort of our next phase. <clears throat> the next phase we really would like to see to look to peak underneath the membrane and do voltage clamping and calcium confocal microscopy at the same time. Look at dynamics of different kind at the single cell. <coughs> but this is not enough because it might be that the explanation is not the single cell level, because for an EAD to form, you just not, don't need trigger activity at the single cell level. I'm being taught that you need synchronization at the larger scale. So I don't know yet at what, whether the, there are several phenomena that we pose and they're not enough, in my view, and other uh, computational biologists to explain the phenomena of uncoupling. We need more data, we need more data to look simultaneously with optical mapping and maybe electrodes, and et cetera. So I don't know yet. We need to study a sodium calcium exchanger uh, at, uh, at this period. I don't know. I don't have yet an explanation to their company. But that's what we'll figure out. I mean, that's what, that's where we are now. Are the hearts depleted in calcium pools in their SR? Could that be a potential explanation? Good question. And the corollary of that is, is there, are there different amounts of calcium binding proteins like calnexin in the SR? So this is work, ongoing work. Uh, cannot come. 
but this is but that that <laughs> these are good good ideas. I don't have our data, so we have preliminary data. Except so that your right. argument is that the calcium waves are still there. Yes, right? I know. Which which actually, since it's an electrical trigger to getting the calcium waves, presumably in the first place, how can it be that you have the calcium no, that, waves? Uh, that 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 um, um, I must say that this is not for sure. <coughs> I saw that calcium started first, so I don't know yet. And it's very difficult to be to to um, get back to this question. Uh, what start first? I think that calcium dynamics is under evaluated or under appreciated in the mechanism of arrhythmia and longitudinal. That's what I would say. I think that some people here are in the right direction. But it's not just window current, and it's not just alta calcium current. And calcium dynamic play roles in arrhythmia, for sure. Yes? Uh, I, I shall follow up question. Why you call this uh, traces of uh, action potential and calcium kind of uncalculable? Do you have for control action potential recordings and calcium transient in normal cell? So, yeah, yeah. So you. So this is an observa this is observation at the optical mapping level. So you have an averaging of about 200, at least 200 cells. It's not a single cell phenomenon. So this and that's the phenomena from... induced by isothermal, <coughs> as I mentioned earlier. So we know how calcium and voltage looks in normal heart. I mean, this is the routine, routine. This is this oscillation and the EAD. Is so you don't. This is abnormal. The, the oscillation is still. Experiment with uh, confocal calcium, you get just piece of tissue with average signal. So, there are multi pronged approach that we are setting up right now to dive into the mechanism. Because what we really want is obviously confocal microscopy of single cell. But we also would like to appreciate if we can do confocal microscopy on the tissue section. What we would also would like to have is maybe electrodes in the heart at the same time that we are doing optical mapping. And so there are many things that we would like to do and going forward we will do. It's always slower that I want because I need to do rabbits. We're breeding them four times a year. Sometimes the phenotype is not what we want and we have to replace the entire female breeding, so uh, I, I'm just I saying that the, I'm the trying to say I'm not expecting that calcium and voltage will be so tightly coupled. I think the second figure is totally normal. Why global calcium or any calcium should follow action potential? Okay. There are enough, well, there is enough literature. I'm here, yeah. I mean, Think. it's actually... Well, there is enough DLA. literature. There is enough literature that we uh, hear, we right. see calcium and, and, and we see calcium following voltage, we see calcium preceding voltage. In the DAD literature, there is a lot of calcium released that cause or oscillation that cause DADs. So calcium, abnormal calcium in the cell or in the heart and no EADs is not a regular phenomenon. Because in the estrogen, we see this phenomenon of calcium and EADs. Now, what comes first, you can always argue. I don't know. But the uncoupling is a phenomenon for progesterone. And not in all rabbits, it's two thirds of the rabbits. Yes. Uh, I wonder if you know what the uh, chow you give to those rabbits. <laughs> is it based on uh, soy products by any chance? Which is, by the way, the largest source of. They estrogen. don't have. They don't. They don't have estrogens through the product. We made sure that. So you check, check yeah. it. Checked it. We checked. And the second question. We I build there with the mice. Yeah, right. <laughs> because it <laughs> might be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Another question I have is. But we have estrogen levels. Sure. I mean, they, uh, we have a slide. So um, you always blame uh, sympathetic stimulation as a trigger. So I wonder if you. I mean, isoproteranol. <laughs> brings up your, your phenomena. Have you looked at differences between beta-1 and beta-2 no. organisms for any chance? No. Good question. We did. Yes, it would be very, very interesting. We see right. some interesting uh, uh, remodeling in human uh, 
uh, between beta 1 and beta 2. But I didn't present data here with the proteomics because there is so much that you can fit to one top. Me, it's actually been now on um, uh, second review of the proteomics of longitude 1, longitude 2, and L normal rabbit. There is abnormal energetics. That longitude rabbits do not look like normal rabbits. Katya is working on mechano mechanical electrical abnormalities in rabbits. So when you have islands of long QT, long QT, you have abnormal mechanics. This is clear. She has proven it with, with um, in her lab with, um, uh, with MRI. <coughs> and then looking at the heart. Um, the, so the way the thing, Beta one, beta two. So, I don't, so what was the second line of my line of thought for this connection? Yeah, 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 beta one, beta two. So, I don't know, beta one to beta two, I don't have uh, uh, the answer. But the point, I'm, uh, the point I was trying to make is that proteomics of this, these hearts are remote. So we found out that all ATP producing enzymes pathways were upregulated in long rabbits. So there is this, you have a long calcium transit, you somehow need to get rid of it. So there is an energy starvation or energy demand that is higher this heart, and likely, and all pathways, like lytic pathway, mitochondrial enzyme are upregulated in this rabbit based on high throughput proteomics. So that's a paper that hopefully will be out soon. Is so it, is there any difference between uh, uh, long QT1 and long QT2? In this principle, no. They're both upregulating both. We see sometimes an enzyme here or the other, but the principle is a pathway, metabolic pathway. So there is close link between calcium, abnormal calcium, and metabolic pathways. And the, this cross stock is very important, and I'm sure it's going to be important as we go forward, perhaps also in environments. There are data, by the way, that the effect of beta 2 on stimulation on the action potential input, King G and also in the trigger is much, much smaller than the effect of the other. So. Yes. Um, I was wondering if there's any data known for the effects of obesity um, on arrhythmia risk and sudden death in long QT syndrome. Um, I know that obesity can lead to increased circulating hormone levels like estrogens, if, if that is something you looked into. So, I don't have an answer to this question, and it's a complicated question in terms of controlling calories. So, <coughs> there, I showed a picture about the weight, if you, if you remember with the hormones, because that was an issue, for, particularly with the hormones. And, and with the hormones, DHT increased the weight, but was protected. But that's usually muscle mass. That's why DHT is the favorite hormone for baseball players. Uh, Home runs. Roger uh, but we didn't, we didn't, the point is that we didn't, so as you, the rabbit age, they become heavier and heavier. And the heart is sort of surrounded with a lot of fat. But we don't have any careful study of weight and arrhythmias in this rabbit. And usually most arrhythmia occur once the rabbit is five months. And we think it's heart size and sexual maturation. Because the rabbit don't die. With one exception, we had the rabbit die earlier whether we, this was a rabbit with estrogen. Otherwise, so for instance, when we study, when we want to study the mechanism of arrhythmia, whether it's ex vivo or in vivo, we have to wait. We don't start, we never study rabbits younger than five months. Now that increases our bill. <laughs> <laughs> one, one last. Uh, Yes. So, uh, going back to uh, Igor's question in terms of uh, fuels and, and how um, an advanced heart failure uh, heart uh, meta metabolizes fuels versus a uh, healthy heart, and this is both post-puberty, um, we actually, um, I was involved in a preliminary study where there is a huge difference in the types of fuels uh, in terms of fatty acids, ketones, uh, simple so sugars um, th that are used as you it, as you go from a, a normal heart right. to advanced heart failure, and so uh, we we had uh, it was we only had 20 patients. It was a 
right. preliminary study, but it would be interesting to see it, if that changes. Um, so the longitude one rivers don't uh, Especially practice. with arrhythmia. Right. Yeah, so the longitude one does. So we have two ongoing projects. Uh -huh. MI, liter rate control versus longitude one. Okay. And there is a definite hypothesis. It's already funded, which is if you have, and the second project is rapid heart pacing, heart failure, and long QT1 versus little bit control. Uh -huh. yeah. So there is a difference. The only time LQT1 rabbit died in our experience is A, we have Black Davy node, and second, okay. we do MI. And if we do MI, they don't die from R on T polymorphism with T. They die with BF, classical BF. Okay. And they but, die more um, than little bit control. Not torsad, just straight Not torsad. BF. Okay. So that's MI. Now, when you do heart failure, that's almost soon will be coming out. Mm -hmm. What will happen with heart failure, they don't die spontaneously. Because we, we are pacing for four weeks. Now we are going to extend the pacing further. And we are pacing at about 30, 370. Well, we start 350 because you can't pace LK1 fast. And then we go, we start, we raise pacing at 370. Now, if you look at the rabbit literature, okay. you could pace. If you pace fast, you what, VF or? So when you pace fast, you get heart failure. Okay. Injection fraction dropped to 35%. Mm -hmm. They don't die spontaneously because we continuously pace and that's protect them until they are four weeks old. And we, Boomer takes the heart out and does particular, and does optical mapping. Mm -hmm. VF frequency, we reason to be, that is all unpublished. <laughs> VF frequency, we thought, will be um, much slower in growth getting one, but it's much faster. So yeah. we have friends there that can tell you maybe why is it, if you have a different energetic demand, why the frequency will be higher in longitude one paradoxically. That's one hypothesis that we are pursuing. But there could be other hypotheses. If your energy requirement is higher, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you'll deplete ATP faster. Okay, well, thank you so much.